Tonight's program was specially called to celebrate the coming of a very great personality. They've all come just to see you, Maharaj. <clears throat> One of the senior most loved, worshipable personalities of our society is His Holiness Srila Indrajumana Maharaj. Throughout the entire world, people literally beg for his association. He came to Krishna consciousness in the very early 1970s, 1970? In 1970, he came to this movement in a very extraordinary way. And from the very beginning, exhibited signs of total surrender to the mission of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Srila Prabhupada. He dedicated his life to preaching. For the past 30 years, undauntingly, fearlessly, he has preached the message of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. In America, in Europe, in Muslim countries, African countries, Indian subcontinent, <clears throat> practically every part of the world, people's hearts have been <clears throat> etched very deeply with the uh, remembrance of His Holiness in Jujumana Maharaj. He's written many wonderful books. He's known for his beautiful kirtans, his soul-stirring, deeply realized kata of Lord Krishna's message. <clears throat> and perhaps the most successful of all preaching projects in the world, he is the inspiring force. I have told all of you in the past, the time when I visited him in Poland, Poland is a very depressed country in Eastern Europe. But yet, because of his incredible determination and enthusiasm and his ability to arouse such love and unity amongst the devotees, three to, three to seven thousand people come every night seven nights a week, village after village, to his programs. And hundreds and hundreds of people are taking to Krishna consciousness. What it takes us months to do for one night in Bombay, to have a large satsang program, he does it every single night in a different place for practically six months of the year. And not in India, in a place where no one has ever heard of Krishna. Thousands and thousands of people dancing and singing. Maharaj is a person who has really given his life, his blood, his sweat, his tears, his everything to help people become Krishna conscious. And he's a person who, personally, I worship his lotus feet for his great example of true devotion. So I'd like all of you to very enthusiastically welcome him to Sri Radha Gopinath. Sri Prahlad Prabhu, who is his wonderful Vaishnav qualities, 
are very much loved throughout the world. He came to Krishna consciousness when he was just a little small boy. And he is the leader of the village of peace. It's a wonderful musical band that literally gets, gets hundreds and thousands of people to sing the holy names of the Lord and dance in great jubilation. <coughs> and Sri Prahlad Prabhu's good wife is also here, Rukmini Priya Mataji. Well, let us welcome both of them. <laughs> Now the awaited moment, His Holiness Indrajumana Maharaj will speak. Thank you very much for coming, Maharaj. I hope I don't disappoint the devotees. <laughs> um, one time Prabhupada told a story of the villagers were, someone came down from the mountains and said to the villagers that the uh, Himalayan mountains were going to give birth. So everyone was very excited. This must be something very great is going to happen. The Himalayan mountains are going to give birth. So all the villagers came out of the foothills up to the mountains and they waited in front of the cave. And that final moment came. The Himalayas were going to give birth. A little mouse came out of the cave. Squeak, 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 squeak. That's me. <laughs> if I'm anything, I'm His Holiness Radhanath. Swami's servant, and to be the servant of His Holiness Radhana Swami, that is something very great. Radhana Swami Maharaj Ki Actually, we have been wanting to come uh, here to Chaupati Temple for many, many years because the fame and the glory of this center is spread very far and wide. I'm sure. Abhyash Guksha Tri Bhuvana, not only here, but uh, higher places as well. When I arrived here the other day, I was immediately attracted. Immediately my heart was melted by the wonderful, affectionate dealings amongst all the devotees. We were made to feel very much as if this is actually our home. Although we've never been here, and we don't know most of the devotees, the nature of transcendental families is such that when you come, even from some distant part of the world, you feel very much welcome, you feel very much as home. As Sridhar Prabhupada used to say, he had many homes throughout the world, many, many different temples. <clears throat> and I was trying to think, what is the unique quality about this, this temple that is so attractive, that has uh, melted this stone-like heart? And I remembered uh, in the 1970s, following, not physically following, but hearing about Sridhar Prabhupada's travels around the world. As you know, in those days, he traveled the world 12 times, introducing and spreading the Krishna consciousness movement. And I remember getting reports from Prabhupada's secretary, Shruti Kirti, and um, different secretaries of Sridhar Prabhupada. <clears throat> and one report came from New York, that Prabhupada arrived in New York, and he saw the beautiful deity worship of his beloved deity, Shishi Radha Govinda. And he said, this is our most important program, deity worship. He said, if we spread this deity worship throughout the world, we'll capture the hearts of the entire world. This is real culture, worshiping the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So all of us were very encouraged in our deity worship in our Paris temple. And then Prabhupada went to Dallas, Texas, and the report came from his secretary. Prabhupada said, this Gurukul, this is our most important project. Uh, raising and training these children in Krishna consciousness, they will be the future leaders of the world. So then we started focusing on our Gurukul. And then Prabhupada went to Chicago, and the devotees were distributing books very enthusiastically, and Prabhupada said, this is our most important program, book distribution. He said, if they just read one line, their life is completely perfect. So then we charged out on book distribution. 
And then Prabhupada went to New Vrindavan and the report came from his secretary. Prabhupada said, this New Vrindavan project, this is our most important program. These farms, Prabhupada was quoted as saying, they should be the shelter of thousands and thousands of people when war breaks out in, in Kali Yuga. And then Prabhupada went to another center and <clears throat> that center was famous for its restaurant. <laughs> and the report came back. This is our most important project, he said. People in this age, they're all dull-headed, <laughs> foolish people. Their intelligence is stolen by illusion. But if they get some prashad, then their brain will be developed. They can understand Bhagavad Gita. Then we opened a restaurant. <laughs> So like that, Prabhupada was traveling around and I was a little confused because everything was the most important project. <laughs> <clears throat> but then um, I read one verse in, Bhagavad, in Srimad Bhagavatam. Krishna varnam tusha krishnam shangopanga shaparshadam yagnai senkitan prayar janti he sumedasaha. That in this age of Kali, that same personality who was Shaima Black, who appeared in the Dupura Yuga and spread the Yuga Dharma. He has now appeared with his entourage in the Kali Yuga and he is introducing the Yuga Dharma for this age, which is Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare So in the purport, Sri Prabhupada describes this yagya as Sam Kirtan Yagya. It means, he described it as the complete yagya. It means all elements are there for the success of spreading Krishna's name. In his commentary on the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Sridhar Swami, he states that anything which makes famous the holy name of the Lord and the glories of the Lord, that is to be known as Sam Kirtan. We generally take Sankirtan as chanting the holy names of the Lord or book distribution. But according to this broad definition of Srila Sridhar Swami, anything which spreads the name and fame of Krishna, Shwayam Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that is to be known as Sankirtan. And that is essential, that is important for the people of this age. So Sridhar Prabhupada was so wonderful that he traveled around the world. He actually introduced a culture. He introduced this Vedic culture, he transplanted the Vedic culture from this part of the world to the western part of the world. Now you know how difficult that is, especially those of you who are doctors. Many of you are doctors. I was at that very wonderful hospital, very glorious hospital today, and there were many doctors and we were speaking with the doctors. So doctors know <clears throat> how difficult a transplant is. Right? You take the organ from another person and you transplant it into a foreign body. And what are the risks of it being rejected? I don't know, but they're probably very great. Very difficult to transplant one organ from one person. How much more so that is in trying to transplant this beautiful Vedic culture in Western materialistic uh, society. Not just one aspect of the culture, not just the singing. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, 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 Hare. But everything about the culture, culture means music, it means dance, it means food, it, it means politics, it means farming, all aspects. Prabhupada was able to do that. So as Prabhupada was traveling in America, he was actually, it was true, this is our most. Every single one of these programs is very, very essential and very, very important. And I was here and I was trying to think, what is it that's so charming about this particular project, and I figured it out. Tesham satari yuktanam vajatam pratipurvikam. To one who tries to serve Krishna, he gives the intelligence by which we can understand him. I figured out what is so wonderful about this project is the very loving and affectionate Krishna conscious dealings between the devotees. If I could think of anything which stands out in this community, it is that very loving, affectionate, warm dealing with the devotees. That's personified in a verse in Upandesham Rita, which Sri Rupa Goswami states, what are the dealings between devotees? And I've experienced these things in just the 24 hours that I've been here, that uh, devotees exchange gifts with each other. One devotee offers a devotee a gift. The devotee accepts that gift. 
devotees exchange realizations. One devotee speaks, the other devotee hears. And uh, five and six, that devotees invite you into their home. You accept that invitation and you take delicious prasadam. So all these things I have experienced in their perfection, I can literally say in their perfection, here in this wonderful Chaupati Center. And actually I remember now, as I was traveling around the world, I traveled most places, practically every single country in the world, <clears throat> with a few exceptions. I've traveled everywhere and I've seen so many projects, so many farms, so many schools, so many, I've seen so many things. Everywhere, everywhere I go, people they say, have you been to Chaupati? Temple? I said, no. Oh, you should go to Chaupati Temple. Something very special there. So I feel very blessed to, to come here. And I, I can actually see that because Radhanath Swami Maharaj himself is full of that love for Hari, Guru, and Vaishnava. Therefore, you are also full of love for Hari, Guru, and Vaishnava. This is the real true a true leader. Prabhupada said any program is only as good as its leadership. All the elements can be there, but if the Krishna conscious personality is not heading up that program, then there'll, there'll be some difficulties. But if you have Krishna conscious leader, first and foremost, Krishna conscious leader, then the devotees will be imbued with that, that same spirit. So anyone who comes here, they feel very much loved, they feel very much uh, wanted, they feel very much Appreciate it, and that's the essence of Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada said. We all want to love, and we all want to be loved. So those loving dealings are very much present here in this Chaupati temple, and therefore I think that everything else is coming because of that. That is the real foundation. Someone may say the foundation of this temple is the, the stone and the dirt that's holding the building up, but the real foundation of the temple is the loving dealings between the devotees, and therefore... You have nice prasadam, you have nice book distribution, you have nice deity worship, you have nice gurukul. It all begins from these loving dealings. So, Sri Pallad has been personally requesting me here to come here for a long time. I think, especially for this reason, to learn this art of loving the devotees and the loving reciprocation between devotees. Because if we learn this, our life is actually successful. So you are all very, very fortunate to be under the shelter and the expert uh, leadership of His Holiness uh, Radhana Swami and I'm very, very fortunate to be here. I'm only here for a very short time but I have invitations to come back for longer. <laughs> um, they took me to the hospital and they told me there's lots of things wrong with me. Hmm. I just had a little sniffle and suddenly I've got to spend six weeks in the Ayurvedic part and five weeks in the other part and I was thinking, okay, if I live or die there, it's fine. <laughs> If you go there and you live, you survive, then you come out and enjoy a wonderful Krishna conscious life. And if you die in that hospital, there's no doubt you're going back home, back to Godhead. <laughs> so because all of you have, have shared something so wonderful with my lowly self, I would like to spend just a few minutes sharing something which is very dear to me with all of you. And I'm sure you will also appreciate it. I took my cue from our leader, His Holiness Radhana Swami. When he visited our Polish tour, he was talking about some highlights, but that, that in itself was a great highlight when he came and we had this wonderful kirtan and he was so affectionate and reciprocating with the devotees and coming out in our Harinams. It was a great source of inspiration. I remember either his first or second lecture, he shared his experiences in coming to Krishna consciousness and his association with Sridhar Prabhupada so a few devotees asked me today and yesterday about the silver spoon, the famous silver spoon, a story which comes from the book called um, Radha Damodar Vilas, the pastimes of Radha Damodar and that wonderful traveling Sankatan party which they oversaw. There's a story in there, a pastime of Sridhar Prabhupada. But I thought I'd go back just a little, a little bit before that, anyway, I'll be speaking about Sridhar Prabhupada, so that is a treasure of all of our lives. Like many devotees, I first met Sridhar Prabhupada through his disciples. At that time, in 1969-1970, Sridhar Prabhupada was, was traveling, but of course he couldn't go everywhere, so many of us 
we're blessed actually to meet Sridhar Prabhupada through the medium of his disciples, just as the spiritual master is a representative of Krishna. So the disciple is always a representative of his spiritual master. I heard Sridhar Prabhupada say one time that we can judge the quality of the guru by the quality of the disciple. So I was fortunate, actually I was so steeped in ignorance, uh, so degraded, so fallen, that it took four sannyasis to pull me out of the quagmire of material life. Um, before coming to Krishna consciousness, I was in the Grihamedi ashram. <laughs> actually, it wasn't an ashram. The Grihamedi well of existence, <laughs> deep well of existence. And somehow or other, Krishna inspired me within the heart to have uh, some desire for spiritual life. So myself and my former wife were visiting different yoga clubs and different institutes and institutions and so forth and so on. We heard one day that there was a museum show on Krishna. Mm -hmm. Krishna? Who's Krishna? Krishna? Museum show on Krishna? So we walked over to the museum and we were wandering around and looking at all that, mainly it was those Pichwai, those Rajasthani paintings you get from Jaipur. I was looking and it was all very captivating, very fascinating. And uh, there was one particular beautiful painting, Ras Lila, and I was so much attracted. This is so nice and this cute little blue boy. There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four. He says, they all look the same in the circle. Couldn't figure it out, so I I asked the, the guard, the museum guard, he was an Afro-American, a black man. I called him, he was sleeping. So I woke him up and I said, sir, could you come over here and explain this painting to me? Who is this little boy and who's Krishna? K-R-I-S. So he came over and he, he looked very closely at the caption. I didn't see there was a little caption. And he said, uh, yeah, it says here that, by, by, boy, this is... This is the good Lord. This is the good Lord. He's up there in the heaven enjoying with the girls. He's having a real fine time up there. <laughs> so I said, thanks. I said, could you explain a little bit more? Boy, I don't know about these things, about the good Lord up there, but he's having a fine time with those girls. <laughs> So then the bell rang the museum for the time for the museum to close. So I said, you all get out of here. You all get out of here. You come back here tomorrow and you can look at more of somebody's picture of the Lord, the good Lord. So I walked out scratching my head. <laughs> Krishna, heaven, girls, you know, dancing, you know, what's, what is all this? Who's Krishna? I turned to my former wife and she said, I don't know. I said, who's Who's Krishna? Who in the world is Krishna? And suddenly I heard this Wow. We love that sound. <laughs> I looked off on the lawn. This was at Ann Arbor University. I looked off and there were these four angelic boys in saffron robes with shaved heads and pigtails in the back, ponytails in the back. <laughs> so I knew something about the Buddhists and I said to my former wife, I said, you know, the, these don't look like people from India. And they, are they Buddhists with ponytails? And look like American boys. Let's, let's go over there and see what's happening. So they were dancing. One was very tall and playing nice drum. <laughs> Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Dum Dum Boom Wow <laughs> I said to my former wife, he's singing about that little blue boy with the girls in heaven. <laughs> she said, Yeah, let's go closer. So this Ann Arbor, this was a very intellectual school. And um there were a lot of students and, you know, those, these were the Vietnam War days and there was a lot of, you know, challenging and contesting and going, debating going on and students and this and that and 
the kirtan stopped and the tall man, he started to speak. And as soon as he started to speak, there were objections. Well, how do you know about that? How can you prove this? And what do you know? And then, Eli, you know, there's no such thing as God. And he was doing his best, you know, to, but they were very, you know, funny, all the students walked away. And I was standing there with my former wife and I was going, wow, that's really nice what he was saying, wasn't it? So he saw that we were the only, out of a crowd of about 40 or 50 students, we were the only ones who remained. So that tall boy, he came over to me and he said, sit down, young man, I will tell you about my spiritual master, his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shira Prabhupada. Boom, I sat down. He must have preached to me for about two hours, and I didn't, I just nod, my former wife said I was just nodding my head the whole time. And he stopped for a moment to do something, take a drink, and she said to me, what do you think about him? I said, I want to be just like him. <laughs> so her fateful words were, that would be very nice. <laughs> he was the first sannyasi I met. <laughs> so he began speaking, and he told me about Prabhupada and about Krishna. And within moments, I felt like I was Shudra Prabhupada's disciple. Actually, one time Prabhupada said, this Krishna consciousness movement, this Krishna consciousness is very contagious in the good way. Just like if someone sneezes, ha choo and I think it's about 10 meters, isn't it, doctors? <laughs> the germs go and someone else can catch that bad disease. And Prabhupada says in Krishna book, when someone is speaking about Krishna consciousness, when he's speaking Krishna kata, the devotee is speaking about the Lord, little drops of nectar collect in the sky and fall on the heads of the audience and turn them into pure devotees. This is the process. So this very nice devotee, later he introduced himself as Vishnu and Jana Maharaj, and there was one big one, very big. His name was Brahmananda. <laughs> and there was one who was very far out. He had, you know, Sika and little mustache. His name was Gargamani. <laughs> he introduced himself as Gargamani. And then there was a short little kind of quiet one. His name was Subal Maharaj. So they were speaking and, you know, even myself, I became a little challenging, you know, Subal. He started to preach to me about something and I said, yeah. And I said, oh, well, I said, if Krishna's providing everything for you guys, where's your shoes, Maharaj? He just had bare feet. He said, yeah, I, actually, I need some shoes. He said, but Krishna will provide. Krishna will provide. I said to him, what, Krishna's going to send him from the clouds? He's going to drop you some, from heaven, he's going to send you some shoes? He said, have faith. Krishna will provide. So I started speaking again to Vishnu John Maharaj. And then a few minutes later, one group of hippies came. And one boy was kind of hobbling along. And I looked down and he had a, a new pair of tennis shoes on. And he was complaining, he said, darn, I just bought these darn tennis shoes and they're too small for me. I wear a size 10 and somehow that guy gave me a size 9. He took off the shoes and held them in the air. He said, anybody need a pair, a, a size 9 tennis shoes? So Subal smiled at me and said, I'm size 9. <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> and Subal Maharaj, he said, I would be very happy if you would give me those, those tennis shoes because I, I need some shoes. I, I will take it as Krishna's mercy. So the boy, oh, of course, Krishna's mercy. He gave him the shoes. <laughs> Subal Maharaj said to me, Hare Krishna. <laughs> so we talked for some time and it was getting dark and they decided they were going to go away. I said, boy, I just met these amazing personality. I said, please, why don't, you, why don't you guys just, you know, spend a couple days with us? You know, we were living in an old broken down, well, it was soon to be broken down apartment building. And actually it was been vacated. There was just, we were just having one apartment and the only a real apartment next door that anyone could live in was next door. So I told these swamis, I said, look, come spend a couple days with us. So Vishnu John, he said, uh, this nice young man, has asked if we could stay with him for a few days and share Krishna consciousness. What do you think, Maharajas? So I remember Brahmanandi folded his arms. He said, Will there be some good prasadam? <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I, I looked at Vishnu Jamaraj, I said, <clears throat> what's prashadam? He said, prashadam is Krishna's mercy. I said, well, I mean, I don't have any Krishna's mercy. So I know uh, food stuff. I said, yeah, we're a vegetarian, you know, no problem. You know, we're eating applesauce and some bananas and some, you know, a little macrobiotic diet, you know, but I'm not sort of going, oh, no. <laughs> so Vishnu Jamaraj, he said, um, do you have a little money? So I just received my paycheck for the month. I was working as a gardener, and my former wife was, I was putting her through school to be a teacher. So I'd worked very hard, I had my paycheck there. So I said, yeah, I have, uh, I mean, I can spare something. You know, I, I can spare something. So I said, all right, we can spend it. Let's go back. And Mission Delmar said, I'll go shopping with this nice boy. Okay, shopping, I thought, you know, we get like, maybe, you know, I don't know, you know a loaf of bread and some cheese and some cream and, you know, a couple of Coca-Colas or something. I, we walked in and, you know, Brahmananda took one shopping cart, Subal took another shopping cart, and Vishnu John took another shopping cart. And they took the three shopping carts to the, you know, the whole store and they were filled up in 10 minutes to this, you know, <laughs> like one of those contests that if you win a certain contest, you get to go to the store for 10 minutes and put everything you want inside and get out. <clears throat> So it came, you know, the thing in LA, and then uh, I had one dollar left over after shopping. <laughs> so we got back to our apartment, and I put them in the apartment next door, and then they came over, and uh, they started cooking. And Avishan John Maharaj, he was a very good kirtan man, a very good preacher, and an excellent cook. And that was my first taste of prashadam. It was, they cooked for like three hours. I said, look, you just put it in the, hot, in, the, in the oven, you know, have it in five minutes. No, no. I said, let me try that. No, no, you can't taste this. This has to be up. God, so many rules and regulations. I said, I do meditation. I'm becoming God conscious. I just sit down and chant my mantra that Maharishi Yogi gave me. And, you know, I'm making, I don't need to do all this. He said, no, this is bhakti. This is love. He said, attention to detail is a sign of love. And every time he said something, he went, wow, that's true. And I was just literally falling in love with these devotees by everything that they did. So they cooked this fantastic feast and uh, you know, it must have been uh, 10 or 15 preparations and then we sat down to take it and we said the prayer and I started eating. I was about six or seven bites into my prasadam and Brahmana said, can I have seconds? <laughs> He'd finish his plate, it was a huge plate, he would finish his plate in about 20 seconds. <laughs> so he got another plate and then you know, seven or eight more bites into my plate. He said, can I have thirds? <laughs> it went up to sixth. He went to six plates by the time I'd finished. So um, anyway, they asked if we had some local friends who could come up. Most of our friends weren't very interested, so we were getting these classes, morning, noon, and night. Morning we had Bhagavatam, afternoon we had Ishopanishad, and the evening we had Bhagavad Gita class. Just the two of us, these four sannyasis lecturing to us. It's the two of us. This is what it took. They dragged me out of material existence. So, uh, they, and then in the afternoon they'd go over and speak in the university and come back. And um, it was getting so nice. And then, you know, two days went by and three days went by. And um, I just got the feeling that they were going to leave. I, I don't know what it was. I, maybe it was something he said in a lecture that sadhus can only stay, you know, three days and then they have to move on. I just kind of had this idea. And then one evening, the last evening, what turned out to be the last evening, um, I challenged Vishnu John Maharaj in his lecture. He was talking about detachment and attachment and how we have to be renounced from this world. So I said, but you're not renounced from that silver spoon. You're a monk, but I see you always carry that silver spoon everywhere you go. I can see you're very, very attached to it. So he said, yes. He said, this silver spoon was Kartamashis, one of the first deities in our International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Prabhupada used to take Kartamashi. He was standing with his flute in a very transcendental pose, cowherd boy. Prabhupada used to take that deity with him to different preaching programs. And one day out of affection, he gave the deity's spoon, which the deity would take his prasad with, he gave it out of affection to Vishnu John Maharaj. Vishnu John Maharaj, he told me, he said, a gift from a Vaishnava, Prabhupada told me, he said, a gift from a Vaishnava is a very, very, very special thing. But I couldn't understand. I said, but still it's silver and you're attached to it. He said, but it reminds me of Krishna. He said, these type of attachments are good. We want to become detached from the material world. 
attached to Krishna. Not that we want to be totally detached from everything. We want to be, I just couldn't understand, attachment. I said attachment is bad. We have to give up all attachments. It's bad. He said no. I said yes. He said no. I said yes. He said no. And that was the end of the conversation for the evening. We went to sleep. And I thought next morning, you know, they would knock on the door, as they always did, at 3 o'clock in the morning, and wake us up, tell us to take our showers for the morning prayers. Samsara dava nalalita loka tanaya karunya ganaganatvam. It was so sweet. So actually, you know, I was getting up at 8 o'clock every morning. That was really early for my meditation. But they started getting us up at 3 o'clock. So I woke up at 3 o'clock. Not because there was a knock on the door, but because there wasn't a knock on the door. And in my heart, I felt this emptiness coming on. I jumped out of bed and I ran out of my room and out of the hallway and I ran to their door and I started banging on their door. Maraj, Maraj, wake up. You're late today. Come on, wake up. It's time for the prayers to Prabhupada. We got a chant. We got a chant. Hare Krishna. Come on. I looked around and there. Their shoes weren't there. I said, wait, what, 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 what's going on? Why aren't the shoes here? I told my former wife, come on, come on, where are the shoes? What happened? They took them and bang on the door, bang, 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 and I banged it so hard it opened. And it was empty. There was nothing in there. I looked and I looked around, and I ran, and I looked and around, and I couldn't see anything. And there was just one little table where they used to have their, where they had their altar. And there was just a few, th I could see something on the table there, and I walked over and, Looked in there and there was a note. Dear Brian, that was me. Um, I can't remember literally what it said, but something to the effect of, we are going now, we're going on with our preaching mission. And he wrote a verse from the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Just as uh, sticks and twigs and leaves come together in a river by the force of the river's waves and are again separated by the force of those waves, so in the same way, we all come together by the force of time and our past pious and impious activities. And by the force of those activities and time, we are again separated. I went, oh no, and I fell on the ground, I started crying. 19-year-old boy, never cried, tough American boy. I just cried and cried and cried. I lost my best friends, my best friends are gone. And then, then my former wife said, look, look, he left you something. He left you. Look under the paper. You didn't see. I looked under the paper, and there was the silver spoon. And I grabbed that silver spoon. I took it to my heart. I said, Maharaj, come back, Maharaj. Oh, Krishna. And I became more attached to that silver spoon than anything else in this world. That way, he taught me the lesson of spiritual attachment. Vishnu John Maharaj, Aki. So they left us a little picture of Krishna and a little picture of, of Prabhupada. And we took that and very reverentially with so much devotion. Not that we, I even have devotion now, but because of their association, we had a little understanding of what is a, de, what is a devotion. Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Shastukhoi. Lava Matra, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoi. Even a Lava Matra, even a, a moment's association with the devotee of the Lord can give us that higher taste for Krishna consciousness. Just like a moment's association with a very intense, materialistic person can deviate you from the path of devotion. So a moment's association with an uh, advanced devotee can fix you up on the path of Krishna consciousness. So that altar became as dear to us as Shishirata Gopinath and Gorni Thai and Srinathji are to you. For it, just, it was our introduction into into Krishna consciousness. And that silver spoon was on my altar for many, many years. And when I took the sannyasa sort of life, I gave it to my former wife as her shelter. So um, I didn't know where they'd gone. I didn't know what had happened. They didn't actually tell us there was any temples. They never mentioned there were any temples. Actually, if you read that Radha Dhammadar Vilas, you'll know that there were some troubles. They, they'd had some arguments and disagreements, and philosophically, they were a little bit off at that point. But you would have never known it as far as what they told us and how much love they had for Prabhupada. They didn't mention the other temples, so I just got on my bicycle, drove all around the city trying to find them. You know, four o'clock in the morning. I went to all the exits of the city that I couldn't find. I came back tired and weary. And 
I thought that there were only four people on the planet that you know, knew anything about Krishna and Prabhupada and the Holy Name and Lord Chaitanya and so forth and so on. So it was a very devastating time. And then later, a couple of weeks later, I met a devotee and I met a person who said he saw some of those orange-clad people in Detroit, which was about an hour's drive away. So I got in my car and I drove to Detroit. I must have driven on every street of the town for eight hours trying to find my friends. Couldn't find them. The next week we did the same thing. We came to a, someone said, yeah, they, I saw these orange guys. They lived in this house down there. And we drove to that house and we walked inside and we smelled incense. And we saw a bead bag hanging from the windowsill and some copans hanging from the, <laughs> from the banister upstairs. And we figured, you know, these, so something like those guys. But no one, we went to the neighbors. Yeah, they just moved out. Wow. Where did they move? Well, they moved down 8311 East Jefferson Street. Oh. <laughs> Jump out of the car. It's Sunday. Right. Just when they're serving the feast, we walk in. Wow. This is just like my friends. Maybe they know something about them. One devotee walks up to me. I said, Hare Krishna. He said, oh, you know about Krishna? I said, yes. My best friend in this whole world. My hero. Vishnu John Maharaj, he told me about Krishna. So this devotee, he had had some disagreement with Maharaj. He said, oh, I don't like that guy, that Maharaj. <laughs> you don't like my best friend? I'm getting out of here, and I'm never coming back. And I stormed out of the temple and slammed the door. <laughs> and the temple president, and you know, about 20 devotees ran after me. No, it's just been a misunderstanding. I said, you speak like that about my friend. I'm never. He introduced me to Krishna. You know who Krishna is? Yeah, yeah, we chant Hare Krishna. We're devotees. <laughs> <laughs> we should never speak about my friend like that. I got him there, slammed the door, boom, I drove off. <laughs> uh, 20 devotees just, you know, whoa, chastising that devotee, you know. So about a month later, somebody convinced me to go back because they had really good food. So <laughs> we went back and. Here we were coming for six months or so, and it's difficult to give up those last attachments, but um, thinking maybe we joined, but if we joined, I had to shave my hair and my beard, and I had to do this, you know, and everything, and we won't have any freedom, and you know, the doubts were coming, and then the devotees were always telling me, if you pray to Prabhupada, then Prabhupada will give you mercy, and you can give up your attachments. I was always praying, but it wasn't working, and then one day, a very, very special day was coming up. It was the appearance day of Prabhupada's spiritual master, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Ki! And the devotees, they told me that famous line that Prabhupada mentioned that sometimes the grandfather is more merciful than the father himself. So they said, you know, we know you're thinking of joining, but you can't give up your attachment, so why don't you pray to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur because He's the grandfather guru, and he'll be very kind to you. So I said, okay, on that day, I'm going to pray to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. So that was about 10 days, you know. So I, I was just like, you know, planning my speech, <laughs> planning my prayer, what I was going to say to him, and how I was going to approach him, and what flowers I was going to... It was like a very, very special moment for me. I, I felt that actually I was going to have like darshan with Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. So that day came, and I had to go to work, so I went to work. I was working as a gardener, and one of my, one of my uh, chores was I had to go into the basement of this house that was on that property. It was actually the president of the university's house. And I had to, you know, uh, clean up after the dog. The dog, he did his business down there in the basement, and I, you know, I had to go down there and clean up after the dog and, you know, put his food there and brush him. And it was a little dachshund. He didn't like me. He used to bite me sometimes, even although you know, devout service I did for him. So I went down there when, this was Bhakti Saraswati's appearance day, and I went down there and I had my little candles and I had my flowers and I had my little prayer all written out. And I went down and I turned all the lights off. And well, first I had to clean up after the dog. And I'm thinking, hey, what am I doing? Srila Bhakti Sananta Saraswati, I could be serving your lotus feet. I could be serving your dearest son, Prabhupada. I could be serving Krishna. I'm serving his dog. But still, I can't give it all up. I get lots of money here. I have lots of plans. <laughs> I said, you know, anyway, 
And I put his little picture there on the ground, and I put a rug out I bought specially for the occasion. I lit the candles, and I lit the incense, <clears throat> and then I did full dandabats. I'd never done full dandabats before. I did full dandabats, just in the dark, in the basement, the candles. Namam Vishnu Badaya Krishna Vishdaya Bhutale Shimati Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Ki Jai. Dear Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, can't you see how fallen I am? I'm down here in this basement, cleaning up these low living entities, and I can't give up my attachments, but I want to become a devotee. I want to serve your dearest son, Srila Prabhupada. Please do something. Help me get out of this job. Help me get out of this material world. And suddenly, whoop, the door opens. It's my boss. <laughs> and he'd been listening at the door. And he walked in. Here's this young, you know, American boy, stretched out on the ground with a big picture of an Indian, you know, sadhu with candles and incense burning. He was a really conservative man. Very, very conservative man. He said, what in the beep, beep are you doing? And I just looked up and I said, I'm praying to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, who's the Guru Maharaj of His Divine Grace, A.C. <laughs> what are you doing? I said, I, I'm praying that I can, that I, that I can become a devotee of the, of the Supreme Personality of Godhood. Lord Brahma said, that's Krishna. He's going, what are you talking about? <laughs> Ishwara Parama Krishna, Satchitananda Vigraha, Anadir Adir God... Sarva Karna Karanam. You're fired. <laughs> so I'm still on the ground, stretched out. I look at the picture of Srila Bhakti Sanasara Swatiku. I say, Thank you, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> and I got up and I walked out. He said, Never come back. I said, No problem. And I gave him the doggy dish, <laughs> and I walked out. So I went back, and I told my former wife, I said, pack, pack the house up, we're leaving. She said, what? I said, pack the whole house, we're moving into the temple. She said, what, what? I said, we're moving to the temple. She said, how is it possible? I said, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Maharaja's mercy. She said, okay. So we packed everything up, and we went to the temple, and, and we moved in. And uh, then in time, maybe... A few months later, the big day of the year came. Prabhupada would come to Detroit Temple actually once a year. And I moved in just a couple of months before Prabhupada actually came. And I thought maybe I would get initiated. I'd only been there like four, maybe five months at the most. And I went to the temple president, please, can I have initiation? And devotees were getting initiated easily in those days after even days or weeks. But our temple president was very strict. He said, one year, then you can take initiation. I said, oh... The Prabhupada arrived at the, at the airport, in Detroit airport, and I remember there were many senior devotees there, and Prabhupada arrived, and um, I think this particular arrival is in the Prabhupada Leva Mrita. Prabhupada's arrived in Detroit. It was either 70 or 71, I can't remember. The, the unique thing I remember about that arrival was that um, everyone was crying. The whole, there must have been 300 devotees in different parts of the Midwest and East Coast that were there. And, you know, Prabhupada just drew out this, this, this bhakti, this love for his lotus feet and for the process of Krishna consciousness, even at that very beginning stage of Krishna consciousness, very early. It was so wonderful. So I remember as Prabhupada came up down the gangway and he came into our vision, I was looking through my camera because there were very, very few pictures of Sridhar Prabhupada. There were some, but few pictures of Prabhupada. In those days, I remember my first impression was that through the camera, wow, he looks just like he does in the pictures. Click. <laughs> and everyone started falling down and crying, and the Prabhupada came, and he, he patted devotees on the head, he embraced senior devotees, he sat down, and I remember one thing from that lecture, and I've met other devotees who were present at that lecture as well. Ravinda Sarup Prabhu was there, and we were just discussing out at uh, Govardhan Hill, he was staying out there for a kartik as I was, and we were talking about our remembrances of Prabhupada. He remembers the same line, my dear God, God brother Bhakti Bringa Govinda Maharaj, one day we were talking, and he said, you know, I was there too. You know what Prabhupada said? I said, that's the same thing I remember. Prabhupada was speaking, and he, 
was speaking to all us young boys and girls, and he leaned over and he said, please, please believe me when I say you are not these bodies. Somehow when Prabhupada said that, it just penetrated in my heart. I started looking at my body for the first time. Yeah, I'm not this body. When you hear these words, when you hear these realizations from the lips of a pure devotee, it has a tremendously power, powerful effect. That's why Prabhupada said this chanting of Hare Krishna, uh, especially this should be heard from the lips of pure devotees, has a very transcendentally powerful effect. And that's very nice. I was thinking I was, as I was out at the hospital today, and the tape of Prabhupada was going on and on. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Nama Nama, Hare. I was thinking, this is, this is very nice. Uh, it's, it, we have so many tapes and music tapes, but I always like, I always have confidence in the leadership when I go someplace and I hear Prabhupada bhajans being played because that sound vibration is so potent, so transcendently potent to destroy the sinful reactions within our heart, uproot our material desires and give us a taste of higher Krishna consciousness. So, uh, Prabhupada... So please believe me when I say you are not this body. Yes, uh, not these bodies. So Prabhupada came to the temple and he went upstairs for a quick change and he came downstairs and there was one little boy who was standing next to Prabhupada's Vyasa son. That boy was, the kirtan was going. That boy was maybe two years old. Mothers, they can just start to hold the kartals. I'm only guessing. About two years old. And he was playing like this. Boom, <laughs> The kirtan's raging. And Prabhupada walks by. Little boy, his name was Vaishnav Das. And Prabhupada looks. Oh. And he patted that little boy on the head. And the mother, she went. <laughs> My little ray of Vishnu. Yes. <laughs> and then Prabhupada sat down. And instead of singing, he just began speaking about how a devotee. He said, a devotee who leaves Krishna consciousness because of his material desires and goes away from the process of Krishna consciousness, gives up the process and goes back to material life to fulfill his material desires. When he leaves his body, he goes to the heavenly planets and there he can fulfill his material desires at the same time get purified and from there transfer himself back to Godhead. That can take a very long time though because as you know the demigods have lived many thousands of years. But he said, but a devotee who is strict but who does not finish the course of Krishna consciousness within his lifetime. He's very strict, but he dies having not yet attained the exalted stage of Prema Bhakti. That devotee, he said, takes birth immediately in the family of devotees. Therefore, he said, these devotees are all, these children, he said, are all very, very special. So he said, treat them properly and raise them to be nice Vaishnavas, he was saying. So all the mothers, of course, they have their babies there on these... <laughs> So I remember that, and as, as long as I've been a devotee, I've remembered that, and I'm, I'm always inclined towards the children in Krishna consciousness, seeing them as actually devotees who in a previous lifetime had not deviated from the process, but had just died untimely, so to speak, untimely, had not yet finished the course of Krishna consciousness. But with the, with the good birth in this life in Krishna consciousness, have every chance of going back home, back to Godhead. So Prabhupada stayed for a few days, and gave us his association. Then he was leaving, and um, I was thinking, well, I didn't get initiated, I didn't get a personal darshan with Prabhupada, but I want to show Prabhupada how appreciative I was that he came to our temple. So as he was going to his car, I, I quickly scribbled a note. Dear Shri Prabhupada, please accept my most humble obeisances. Thank you so much for coming to Detroit. I'm going to miss you so much, and I'm going to feel so much separation from you. Please accept this $10 for your newly created book fund. Your servant, Bach to Brian. So I probably was just getting in his car when I ran downstairs and put that $10 in the envelope. And I was getting in the devotees were all around and I said, shoot a Prabhupada, wait! And like everybody froze. <laughs> Prabhupada turned around with a big, you know, amazing look on his face and I got all, hmm, what did I do? <laughs> and I walked up to Prabhupada, I got very close and I said very softly, I said, Shri Prabhupada, this is for you. And looked him in the eyes and he said, Hare Krishna, thank you. And that was one of the best days of my whole life. That, you know, a spiritual master, if he appreciates your service, then your life is perfect. Actually, that's all devotees want. In the material world, no matter what you do, you can become prime minister, you can become president, you can become 
you know, the richest man in the world, but you don't get the sa- same satisfaction if your spiritual master says to you, thank you very much for that devotional service. Because you can know if you please your spiritual master, then Krishna is pleased with you. And if Krishna is pleased with you, your life is perfect. So I experienced it. It was just a short exchange. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. But it meant everything in the world to me. Everything in the world. So about 10 days later, a letter arrived in the mail. Now in those days, when a letter came from Prabhupada, it wasn't just the property of the devotee to whom Prabhupada was writing. It was considered that that was temple property. (laughs) (laughs) So what happened is that devotee who's who was, um, that letter was two, he got that letter and and we blew a conch. In the middle of the day, that man, a letter from Prabhupada arrived. Whatever we were doing, just like the gopis, (laughs) they gave up everything and just ran to see Krishna in the forest. So, you know, we just gave up every, whatever we were doing, we just dropped and we ran down to the the living room of the temple and we all sat down. That devotee read the letter. So, whoo! Prabhupada, a letter from Prabhupada, a letter from Prabhupada, it came down and we're sitting there. I was thinking, oh, maybe the temple president will get it. And then, you know, it was like transcendental, you know, roll call in the military or something. You know, they picked up and they said, uh, Prabhupada is writing Bach to Brian. And at first it didn't register, you know. Everyone looked at me, oh, me? Me? Prabhupada wrote me a letter? I was thinking, you know, my first thought was, Prabhupada knows I exist? <laughs> oh, me? So the little, you know, hands were shaking, you know. <laughs> like, you know, what if Prabhupada's going to chastise me or something, you know? How am I going to read it in front of everybody? My gurus chastise me. Okay. <clears throat> my dear Dr. Brian. Oh, he called me dear. <laughs> <laughs> Please accept my blessings. Um, I want to thank you so much for the letter which you gave me as I was leaving the, De- the Detroit temple. I also want to thank you very much for the $10 which you have very graciously given from my newly created book fund. I have information from the authorities in the temple that you are doing very well in your first months of Krishna consciousness. So please continue. And my instruction to you is always follow in the footsteps of advanced devotees and surely in a very short time you will become Krishna conscious and I will be very happy to accept you as my duly initiated disciple your ever well wisher A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Siddha Prabhupada Siddha Prabhupada Ki So this is an even more intimate exchange and this is actually how the process of Krishna consciousness works. These loving dealings, these loving exchanges between devotees, between the disciple and the spiritual master, between the devotees and the Lord. Are we meeting the Lord? Yes. The Lord is kindly every day giving us his, his darshan and encouraging us with his transcendental form and his prashadam and his holy name. These things endear us so much that it's very easy to give up our attachments to this world. What would otherwise take lifetimes of penance and austerity and study and knowledge becomes very easy in the loving, transcendental relationships with the devotees. Therefore, I say all of you have a very, very good chance of going back home, back to God in this very lifetime because of the sweet, loving exchanges that you have in this wonderful Chaupati temple. So we received that letter from Sridhar Prabhupada. And um, then a couple months later, Sridhar Prabhupada requested... Uh, the temple president of our temple, Bhagavan Das, he requested him to go on a uh, frontier mission to go to Europe and start a temple in Paris, France. So he was looking for someone to go with him. So I'd been to Europe for a two-week vacation one time. So he said, does anyone know how to get around Europe and where to stay and how to take the trains and, you know, where to eat? And I said, Yes, I know everything about it. I travel all over the place. I can go with you. So my wife's going. <laughs> 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 so 
then um, His Holiness Satsvarup Maharaj visited the temple the next day and I was in duality if I should go to Europe or I should go on a newly created transcendental road show. I'm sure I don't know how Swami knows about the transcendental road show. Kirtananda Swami and Vishnu John and different devotees. So I was, I was inclined to go to New Vrindavan and join New Vrindavan and join the transcendental road show. I asked Satsarup Maharaj and he thought for a moment, I said, I'll do whatever you say, Maharaj. I'll go to Europe or I'll go down you know, with, with uh, Vishnu John Maharaj. He said, hmm, well, go to Europe. I said, okay. 